Romans 9. I'm going to give a brief summary of Romans 9 to kind of explain to you what the chapter is about. And it's not easy. There have been many debates on Romans 9. Basically, Romans 9, some people assume that in this chapter, and then you can look it at yourself, or if you're familiar with the chapter, I want you to follow along with me the breakdown. Uh, this does not have to be part of your notes, but I just want to give you an idea, so it's going to be kind of fast, because I want to just break it down. This ain't the part of the message. It's just an intro to try to give you an idea. Romans 9, that's been a chapter that's used that God can elect people for salvation and God can elect people for damnation. However, the chapter is not about individual election. It is actually about a national election. If you start off at Romans chapter 9, usually you can tell what the subject is about by the introduction and the conclusion. That's just common sense in any PhD paper. That's just common sense in research. That's just common sense in anything that you read about. The Calvinists ignore the intro and the conclusion and focus on the middle. When you do that, then you divert from the main attention what the topic is about. The introduction from verses 1 through 7, you notice it's why God chose uh, the Gentiles and rejected Israel. And if you look at the conclusion from verse 25 through 33, God concludes again why he chose the Gentiles and rejected Israel, uh, rejected Israel. So you can see right here, Romans 9, that's what the subject was in mind from the author. With that in mind, that's why what he did was from verse 1 through 7, he introduced it to why God rejected Israel and accepted Gentiles, and then Paul had to explain it. So now there's the middle part of the subject. So then from verses 9 through 13, God was explaining uh, why he chose Israel, not other descendants, but the descendants of Israel, and why he rejected all other descendants based on three separate cases to demonstrate that. So he used individual examples, individual cases to explain why he chose Israel and their descendants and not the, uh, uh, why he chose Israel and their descendants and not Ishmael, Esau's, or other lines. Three separate cases. Not that they're related to each other, but that they're separate cases to support his conclusion. So then the verse 9 was his promise to Sarah. And then verse 10 through 12, where he gave that promise before they were born about the elder serving the younger. And the third separate case, because I love Jacob and hated Esau. So three separate cases on that one. You notice Calvinists, they'll mingle everything together, but that's not how you proper, properly do things. Sometimes when you give an argument, you give three uh, sub points, or you can give like three separate cases or examples, but then these three separate cases and examples uh, are not meaning the same thing with each other. They have no relationship to each other. Sometimes this argument right here, you'll have this one to support this one, this one to support this one, this one to support this one. So then in verses 14 through 24, Basically, the whole idea with choosing Pharaoh and then choosing Moses and then choosing the vessels of honor, dishonor, the idea is God has the right to elect or to choose however he wants to with unbelievers and believers. It's that simple. So when you choose to uh, be an unbeliever or not to believe, then God can do whatever he wants with you and send you to hell or use you, your unbelief for his glory, and he can do the same thing with a believer because he's not going to waste it. And then verse 30, and then you'll notice that uh, 25 through 33 confirms that the subject was about believing here. Why God chose the Gentiles, not Israel. Why? Because the Gentiles chose to believe, but the Israelites chose to remain in their unbelief. And that's the reason why God chose the Gentiles and not the Jews. So he confirms it again. That's your whole Calvinism in a nutshell. Take that, John Calvin! All right. All right, so that's the introduction. Now that you understand what the whole subject is about, that basically, God has the right to choose what he wants for his glory. And 
You cannot resist it at verse 19. Romans 9, 19. Thou will say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? From this passage right here, we can see that you cannot resist it, that he is irresistible, that he can do what he wants at the end with an unbeliever and then a believer. So I would like to talk to you some things in this passage that builds up how irresistible my God is. And no matter how much you might question it, like in this passage, verse 19, and how much you might hate it, I want to tell you something. There's still, you can't help, but there's still something irresistible about God and about Christianity. And you might be messed up in the world, the flesh and sin and whatever you're messing around with, but there's something you know deep down inside of your heart that makes God irresistible to you and you can be a hater and you can have an oppressive spirit and your spirit might be down today but let me tell you something you can't help but there's something irresistible in God and that he draws you in there is something irresistible in the singing there is something irresistible in the preaching and the summer camp no matter how much your flesh may hate it and find some problems that happen here and there today and yesterday you still can't help but there's something irresistible why am I still sitting here why didn't I walk out the room yet because God, there's something about him that's irresistible and you can't help it. Yeah, you hater, you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chew down your hate and make you, make you realize that, you're at, that deep down inside, you're stuck in a closet. And I'm not talking about a closet homo, but you're in the, deep down inside the closet, you actually love God. Christianity. There's something appealing about that book. And I don't care if you're an atheist or a liberal. I'm going to show you there's something irresistible. The title of my message today, and God says this, haters find me irresistible. Just can't help it, man. You find me irresistible, God says. I'm going to prove it today. And that's the first point. Can't resist a good sermon. Can't resist a good sermon. You'll notice that it is all over. Paul used so much scripture at Romans 9. He was sure preaching a message. He used the scripture so many times to preach. Verse 6 through 7, he was quoting the word of God twice. You'll notice that verse 9, uh, verse 6 through 7, not as though the word of God had taken none of it, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but notice, in Isaac shall thy seed. Be called. So he's quoting scripture, referring to scripture. You'll notice that verse 9. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. He's quoting scripture again. Verse 13 he quotes it. Verse 15 he quotes it. 17, 25, all the way to 29. And look at verse 33. As it is written, the old I lay in Zion, a stumbling block, a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Notice that he was quoting scripture. You know why you can't resist a good sermon? Because they're not smiling at you, showing you a PowerPoint presentation, and then just quoting one scripture with 10 other different modern versions and just giving you life examples and motivational speeches. No, they preach to you the word of God when that book is quoted and preached out of the pulpit. It doesn't matter your style, your personality, or your, how different your delivery is. That book will convict you. It'll preach at you. And you can't help when that word of God is quoted. There's something irresistible about it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, look at verse 9, verse 9. For this is the word of what? Promise. You know why you can't resist a good sermon? Because how can you resist and hate a good sermon on God's promises? How can deep down inside you, you still hate preaching after the preacher says right here, man, in heaven, you're going to have a mansion for free, streets paved out of pure gold, got the tree of life, You'll be in all eternity. No more sin. No more sorrow. No more depression. No more loneliness. No more aches. No more heartaches. 
and no more Satan and no more anything else that displeases the Lord and is unholy and unclean. How can you hate it after that? When, they, when a preacher preaches a sermon on heaven, how can an atheist sit down and hate it after that? You know why he's hating outside? Because inside, there's something that's loving it. And there's something that smiles and he's like, no, can't smile. I gotta show I'm an atheist. Preach a sermon on heaven. Let's see them hate that after that. Woo! Bless God. You got a hope. Eternally secured, a hope, a promise that when you go to heaven, you can know 100%. How can you hate that? There's something inside you that cannot resist it, and you cannot help but just stand out of your seat and shout and say, Bless God! How can you resist it? Yeah, some of you right now sitting in your chairs trying to find anything out of this summer camp where you can hate and hate. Go ahead, you hater, you. You're going to have a miserable week because you got the Holy Spirit inside you and something deep down inside cannot go there. You know, like some churches and then have the money and then pay him to go down on the altar and get right with God. I think there will still be people who are willing to do that. You know what? They're that crazy. They're that foolish to say, I'm praying to hear a good sermon. Convict me, yeah. Preach bad about me again. Tell me I'm rotten. Tell me I need to get right with God. Rebuke me. Rebuke me. Yes. Amen. Yeah, deep down inside, you can't resist it. You can't resist it. Yeah, bless God. You can't resist some good, old-fashioned preaching to convict and change you. All right, verse 17 going to look at verse 17. The Bible says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for the same purpose, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. You know why you can't resist the Lord right here? It's so that he can be glorified. His name resounded throughout all the earth. You know what is in sync with that one, believe it or not? Look at Psalm 48. Psalm 48. You know what that can mean in some other portions of Scripture? It can also mean singing. It can also mean sinning, singing. My second point, can't resist the good singing. Can't resist the good singing. Look at Psalm 48, verse 10. According to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. See that? A little similar. Let me re read Romans 9, 17 that we read. And that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. See that? All right, look at Psalm 66. Psalm 66. Verse 4, Psalm 66, verse 4. You know how God's name can resound throughout all the earth? Through praise, through singing. Amen. Psalm 66, verse 4. All the earth shall worship thee and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Woo! Silah. All right, let's look at Psalm 148. Psalm 148. Verse 13, Psalm 148, and verse 13. Yeah, you can't resist a good singing. Psalm 148, verse 13. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. Notice right here that his name is resounded throughout all the earth through praise. Try as you might to hate, you can't resist the good singing. The world hates that name so much. Where his name is resounded throughout all the earth, they hate the name of Jesus so much. Yet the world can't help but have over 10,000 songs on Jesus. The world can't help it. It's just the name of Jesus. No other name sounds so well on a song. You know that? Yeah. No other name sounds so well in a song. 
We have heard the joyful sound. Buddha saves, Buddha saves. Just out of sync, doesn't it? Let me try again. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Just sounds right, doesn't it? Just sounds right, right? Man. It's the name of Jesus that fits well. Yes. Try, put yes. Muhammad there. Don't sound right. No. Yes. Put Joseph Smith. Makes you want to trash your golden underwear after that. <laughs> when, you, when you put other names over there, it just doesn't sound right. But you put that name, that very name of Jesus. No other song, no other song was dedicated He's not God. He's just a man. That's some man. No other man in history, my friend, had that many songs about him. Lady Gaga, Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift couldn't even make all their popular billboard hits about their own name except the name of Jesus Christ was lifted up. Jesus has authority. Jesus has the power. That's why those rap, rock, pop artists have to take the name of Jesus for themselves. Kanye West, West takes Jesus for himself. You know why? That name has authority. It has power. No other name. No other name. LeBron James? No. Get out of here. That's why he has to take King James. No other name, bless God. Man, what a name. That's why you can't resist it. Something inside you just can't help it. That's why the atheists, they're closet Christians. Not closet homos, but they're closet Christians. Every time Christmas happens, they cannot help. You know, when they hear that name of Jesus, they hate those Christmas carols when Jesus' name is brought up and all the world sings about Jesus. Not about Obama, not about Biden, but Jesus, 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 Jesus. They hate that. That's why they have to show their hatred. I hate Christmas. We must make Christmas illegal. Get rid of the name of Jesus. You know why? Because they're closet Christians. They just want to say the name of Jesus. Amen. And next time when you hear them cuss out and take God's name in vain, tell them this. Why are you using that name? Why don't you use Buddha? Why don't you use Mohammed? You must love Jesus like I do. Amen. I, they love that name so much, they have to use it for cussing. Yeah. It's so natural to them, yeah. they cannot cuss without saying the name of Jesus. Right. Why can't you resist that? Oh, you hater, you! You can't, you find him irresistible, don't you? Yeah. Oh man, CNN, every time they op open their full mouth and then... They always have to do a coverage. You know, they don't talk about some Muslim over there that blew himself up and some kind of homosexual sodomite parade that just went uh, chaotic and wild with the BLM protests and everything. No, no. They have to take like one or two or three crazy Christians and put that all, all over public news. You know why? There's something about Christianity they find irresistible. And they said, we'll put you at the headline front page right here. Why? CNN loves Jesus that much. They, they need to find Jesus, any subject on Jesus. They need to talk about him so well. They're so obsessed with Christians. They're so obsessed out of all churches, Baptist churches. Why are they so obsessed to find something about it? Every time you see those hate mail and hate explanation, hate news coverage, guess what? They're just that obsessed about the Baptist movement. Wow, man, wow! Haters just find Baptists irresistible. Give them an application to sign up for a Baptist church. Might as well, man. Oh, man, why is it that, that, that those schools always pick down out of all other religions? Christianity in the secular schools. Always try to put, they always talk, try to put Jesus on a lower level. And then, you know, why do they keep criticizing that? They're obsessed with Christianity. They find it so irresistible, man. Why, why is it that you get those modern Bible version scholars in seminaries? Out of all Bibles, out of all Bibles. Out of all Bibles, it's that King James only crowd. That King James only. What's the matter, man? You, do you worship the King James Bible? 
You must want, you love it so much. You adore it so much. Right? Why do you have to talk lessons on this? You know why? This book is irresistible. Yeah. Imagine write, writing your whole life a book talking about the King James Bible yeah. and selling books on it, yeah. trying to critique it. Why do you write a whole book just on the King James Bible? My friend, you must love that book so much. You're so obsessed with it. You will make a living selling your books without the King James Bible. You should thank the King James Bible. You should thank us King James Only Advocates for you getting money for selling books critiquing the King James Bible. You're welcome. Oh, haters, haters, they find it irresistible. They hate, it. they hate the name of Jesus so much, but when that name is resounded, and when we sing songs about it, and when we sing songs about the word of God, guess what? The world hates it so much, but why are they so obsessed with it? Why do they want to keep talking about it? Something deep down inside, they're a closet Christian! Man, the flesh might try to sit down, right? And resist. You might be that person that, no, 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 my brand of music is, is what? Rap? Pop? Yeah. Rock? Heavy metal? Trust. Yeah. That's, uh, no, nah, you know, the songs in this summer camp don't get to me. I'll pity you. Yeah. I'll pity you the next four days. Woo! And I guarantee you when you hold that song and you read that, I'm going to watch your foot and you might go like this. <laughs> You're going to go like, but I'm going to look at your foot. You're struggling with your sexual identity right now? Yeah. You closet Christian, you. you! Why don't you convert, huh? Why don't you convert? Why don't you run around the room? Why don't you shout? Why don't you sing it out to the Lord? That's right, come on now, come on now. Something deep down inside, you can't resist that Holy Ghost. Oh, you say you hate Jesus. You hate that name and you try to put up above other names and you try to shut your mouth in singing and you try to resist. But you can't resist after hearing, There is a name I love to hear. Amen. CNN talks about it every day. <laughs> it sounds like music in my ears. The sweetest name on earth. Resist this. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, you can't resist it after that. Resist it. Resist it. Come on. Sit down. Get angry at me. Resist this. What sins are you talking about? I don't remember them anymore. From the book of life, they've all been torn out. I don't remember them anymore. Depression can be hard to resist. But guess what? Your depression can't also resist. Are you weary? Are you heavy hearted? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Oh, I know depression is hard to resist, but guess what? That depression of yours can't resist that. Those words either. Can't resist the good singing. Yeah, bless God. Depression issue, guilt issue, misery issues. You're down in the dumps. Yeah, it's hard to resist it in your own strength, in your own ability, isn't it? Very tiring, huh? Yeah. Sing a hymn. Your depression yeah. can't resist yeah. it either. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Look at verse 18. Verse 18. My third point, can't resist a good stiffening. Can't resist a good stiffening. The Bible talks about stiffen, harden hearts. And this is important to hear now, okay? In verse 18, Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. 
Verse 22 through 24. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Now I want you to think about this. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 6, 1 Samuel chapter 6. You know God's going to get glory no matter what. No matter what you do, he's going to make sure to get glory out of it. And if you choose to sin, go down the wrong path, God will help you out and he will harden your heart so that he can get glory out of it. But didn't you know that there are those verses that when God hardens you so that he can get glory out of your destruction, he can also do that, harden your heart so that you can finally see the mess and the errors of your ways and finally realize I had enough and I need to let go and repent. You know, Pharaoh, he said, I'm not going to let those people go. I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let God's people go. But you know what he did at the end? He let them go. Look at 1 Samuel 6, verse 6. Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts, as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? Now look at this, how God used it when he hardened their hearts. When he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the what? People go, and they departed. You know what God did for Pharaoh and those Egyptians, he hardened their hearts to a point where they had enough, where they realized their Egyptians God were truly folly, and that the Hebrew God was superior. And then Pharaoh said, I let them go. At the beginning he said, no, 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 no. And God hardened, hardened, hardened his heart up till that day. And then he hardened him to a point where Pharaoh said, ah, I let them go. You know, God will do that to you. Sometimes he'll... Uh, help you out in the wrong decisions, answer the wrong prayers. And then you've seen those members in church that you thought there was no hope they wouldn't get back. All of a sudden, years later, you see them come back. Those hardened faces, hardened hearts, all of a sudden you see them back. And they turn a, one, turn a 180. You know what happened? God had to put them through a hardening process. Not you. God had to do that and make them see the errors of their way and their folly and get that prodigal to come back home. Get them to repent. Oh, my friend, don't you remember that time when you had to go through hard situations and you wouldn't let go like Pharaoh. No, I'm not going to let go. I'm not going to let go. And you wouldn't let go of your job and your sin and your worldly friends and your dreams, your future career, your plans, the person you're going to marry, the person you're going to date, and then everything you planned out, your 401k and everything, you wouldn't let go. And God, don't you remember that time where you went through a hardened situation, hardened situation, and out of great pride like Pharaoh, you got hit to the ground. And then you realize and say, God, okay, I'm wrong. I repent. I hated that preacher that time when he was preaching my sin and that Bible-believing church because they kicked the wrong doctrine right there. But I'll go back, Lord, because there's no place to go. And that's what you're going to find out one day. There is no other place to go. And when you go through hardened situations, man, bless God, don't you remember that time? I don't know if some of you, before you got saved even, where God had to put you through hardened times, hardened situations. And you remember that time when you mocked the name of Jesus? You didn't really care much about Christianity. You thought church was dull and boring, and you lived your life out in sin and dug yourself a deeper hole, and then you lost people in the process. You lost good things in the process. You reaped the consequences of your sin. And bless God, it was finally when God hardened and hardened, put you through hardening situations, you finally broke down and repented, came back to church, sang the old songs you used to sing, read that old book like you used to read it, love Jesus like you used to love Jesus. Finally, you came back home, you prodigal son, you. 
And when you are lost in sin, aren't you glad that God saved your soul from hell? I don't see there are some people here who, if you hear their testimonies, it's just rotten. It's filled their lives with sins. But you notice once they came to church, there was no turning back. You saw them. You know why? They know what's back there. They've been through the hardened situation. They said, no, no, no. I'm going to let all those things go. I decided to follow Jesus. Praise the Lord. Bless God. Aren't you glad where you are now? How many of you were hardened hearts and now you're here? Man, you haters, you thought you hated Christianity. You just find this irresistible. Look at verse 25. Verse 25. Look at verse 25. Romans 9, 25. The Bible says right here, As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. Look at verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You know what? You can't resist. You can't resist a good sympathy. You can't resist a good sympathy. Do you know what Jacob means, pastor? You don't know what I've lived my life in. There were things that I can't tell people in this room that I'm ashamed to talk about. Oh, you don't know. God can't use me. God will never use me. And I messed up. And you don't know me. You don't know how wicked I am. You got the wrong guy. No, you're the right guy. Amen. You might say, why? Have your beef with God as scripture. Look at verse 25. As he saith also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were what? No. Not my people. And her beloved, which was not beloved. I'm un you'll never love me after I did. You're the exact person Jesus Christ wants to use for his glory. You're the exact people that Jesus Christ died in your place and decided to give you a home, a Bible-believing home, a Bible-believing life. Man, why would God ever love someone like you? He did. He wants, he Wants you to come to him. You know, you may not hate the love of God, but I do know this. Your depression hates the love of God. And I do know this. Your anger hates the love of God. Your guilt complex hates the love of God. And your fear issues, worry issues hate the love of God. Because if you only knew his love, you wouldn't have these issues. But you're still struggling with these issues. You know why? Those issues of yours hate the love of God. But it's those times where I remember his love. And I can't help but find him irresistible. Those times where I struggled with fear. And then worried about tomorrow, the future, how to make a living, what to do with my future life. How can I go on in this church? And it's those times when I remembered his love. His promise of love that I'm going to take care of you. Why do you worry about tomorrow? And that perfect love casteth out fear. Amen, See, if you remember his love, how much he loves you, his loving promise, those issues would be gone. Thank God that he loves you. You can't help but find him irresistible when you hear, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. And when you hear that, that depression melts away. That loneliness melts away. The misery melts away. The fear melts away that God loves me. Amen. And when that verse goes, that all the very hairs on your head are numbered. And the depression melts away. The fear melts away. The misery melts away. The worry melts away. Is when I remember his love. Remember this. 
And you're down on your knees and you go guilty. Oh, God, I messed up. And oh, Lord, I, there's nothing that I can do with my life. Remember this. God says, hey, child, I love you. Remember that. I'm ready to forgive. I'm ready to use you. Yeah, there may be re there's reaping and sowing. But you know what? Even through chastisement, I love you, son. People doubt their salvation. People think they can lose their salvation because they struggle with the same problem or because they're so paranoid after listening to Paul Washer and then they go, am I really saved after that? There's this in that I never thought of before. You know what the Bible says? The Bible talks about that neither height nor death, any other creature, things present, things to come, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Nothing can separate you from his love. Sin all the times. His love will outrun them all. Amen. Yeah, you can't resist a good sympathy. Your depression might think so. Anger might think so. Guilt might think so. Fear might think so. But guess what? God's love will always remain. Can't resist it. No matter how much you want to deny Romans 8 and get out of his love, get out of his salvation. Fall into his wrath. I don't care if you want to go to hell, even if you wanted to. Yeah. If you receive Christ for your salvation, bless God, you're doomed to be loved for eternity. I'm sorry. And if you're mad at me after that for preaching and teaching OSAS, I'm sorry. Look at verse 26. Look at verse 26. Can't resist a good summer camp. Can't resist a good summer camp. A.K.A. Zion. A.K.A. Zion. Look at verse 26. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them. Notice that there's a residency where he bases this. Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. There? Where? 33. As it is written, behold, I lay in Sion, a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Amen. Bless God. You can't resist a good Sion. Try as you might, yeah. you can't resist it. You can't resist it. What fool would pay almost $300 and sacrifice all the times and hours of their schedules, drive nearly eight hours or more to come over here? Why would they do that? You can't resist a good summer camp. You're Zion. Bless God, man. How can your flesh hate summer camp? And try as you might with your flesh, trying to find you know, the problem with people here and there and the preacher here and there and then trying to pro find problems with the weather, you know. It's too cold, it's too hot, and there's no air conditioning amenities, no heater. Pastor said that this, they would have these amenities. They didn't have those amenities. And try as you might that the, the weather climate is too dry and it's poor for my health. Oh, I'm sick, my back hurts, my head hurts, oh, I'm dizzy. Try as you might. You can't resist a good summer camp and you're foolish enough up to drag yourself here and sit down to a preaching. Amen. Didn't you know what you signed up for in summer camp? You signed your death warrant. Yeah. You said, well, yeah, I know that there's going to, it's a long drive. And yeah, I know that my job's going to look down on me if I take those days off. And yeah, I know that uh, there's other things I could do in my life. And oh, I'm not good in health. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. But hey, here's $300. I'm coming. A bunch of morons, man. You know why? You can't resist. I've got summer camp. You can't resist the fellowship. You can't resist the brother and sister in Christ. You can't resist the testimonies. You can't resist one brother running. You can't resist one sister going on the altar. You can't resist some preacher preaching the hellfire out of you. And bless God, you're like, I'm going to go down for this. You can't resist it. You find summer camp irresistible. Try as your mind, even right now, your flesh. You can't resist the summer camp. Man, you know what? You know what Bible believers are saying right now in this camp? 
haters find me irresistible. <laughs> you know, the, uh, one of the worst fights you can ever have is inside the church. One of the worst enemies you can have is inside the church with a fellow brother and sister in Christ. Why are you stupid enough to come here? Oh, there's something about the brethren you find irresistible. It's a love-hate relationship. And yeah, you're in my own. And oh, I love you, brother and sister. I, oh, brother, and I forgive you in the Lord. And oh, but so-and-so, and you gossip to somebody. It's a hate-love relationship. You know, you just, haters find this irresistible. They find church irresistible. Totally different from online when you're all alone. Go to a church and you go, man, I got to come back again. <laughs> oh, you just find this irresistible. Nothing like fellowship with your family. But by the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Can't resist that. How can you, your flesh hate camp when you're on the mountaintop? Zion is a mountain. We're at the mountaintop. Amen. We're at a mountaintop experience. Yes. Mount of transfiguration. <laughs> and then we're going, we think the rapture's going to happen right now because it's just so good, you know. We're so arrogant to say all the time, you know, the rapture's going to happen today. You know why you're <laughs> foolish enough to say that? It's because, oh, this is so great. Jesus must have come. Jesus is going to come down right now. Yes. You're in a mountaintop experience. But why is it your flesh would hate it? It's because of the mountain climbing. You hate the mountain climbing, not the mountaintop experience. It's all the mountain climbing. Oh, I had to, went through a fight with my family, and broken situation at home, and summer camp's the very next day. Some of you went through demonic attacks, hardships before you came here, and you're like, man, summer camp has to be tomorrow. I got to take care of this crisis going on, and then, Wow, I, I don't know if I should go to summer camp or not. You know why? You're a mountain climbing, and it's so hard. But guess what? You're at the top. Mountain climbing's behind you. Yes. It's behind you. If it's behind you, and you climbed so hard to get to the top here, why lose it now? <laughs> Dumb enough to climb, go mountain climbing again? Be foolish enough. Get off the mountaintop. Start climbing again. You know, it didn't do you a lick of good. You didn't like that. Oh, I have to go back to take care. Take care of what? Mountain climbing? <laughs> I got to go back because of, because of what? You love that mountain climbing, that trial, that sweat, that tear, that pain so much. Hey, baby, I'm on the top. Might as well stay here all the way through Monday to Friday. Can't kick me out. If you want to drive, go back home, be my guest. Get off the mountaintop, go mountain climbing again. Prove your worth as a strong Christian. I can do this. I don't need a revival. Go back home. Man. If you're on the mountaintop, stay there. Because mountaintop is not forever. You got to go back to mountain climbing again. You know why you climb the mountain all this time? To get to the top. Every trial and situation that you endure and you climb through, it's to get that blessing at the end. That little mountaintop experience at the end. And then why take what you have for granted? Did you, know what our, did you know what my church was like before our mountaintop experience? Do you guys even know when? What it was like back then? Only probably one or two would know what it was like back then. It was mountain climbing. And now we're at the mountaintop. We're at a peak. We can have camp and blowout. Amen. Why get out of church now? Why are the people who are new and start to come to our church when we're on the mountaintop, why get out now? Why are you in BBCI after all the mountain climbing that they went through? I was there with them. Remember, young, remember, pastor, where we had one member and it's the guy sitting behind you? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't preach at an audience. 
I had to preach at his sin every day, it sounded like. I couldn't preach at the pastors. They were older than me, so they had to sit behind me or something. So I could keep pointing at him. That was rough mountain climbing. But you're at the top. And you got little kids who can praise the Lord. Your kids found other kids where they can make friends. You young adults found other young adults to make friends. You don't have to go mountain climbing. Don't go back to college. Don't go back to your lost friends and family members. Stay right here. Look at Acts 7, and I'm done. Acts chapter 7, and we'll close it off at verse 51. So why resist the Holy Ghost? You ever heard that saying, you know, oh, you know, people just find me irresistible. But when some arrogant person saying that, right? Because they're just so good with people. But in the end, even if that person has, has such a charisma, such a power and influence to drive people where they cannot resist him, in the end, the person always has a free choice. They're the ones to decide to join that irresistible spirit right there and join along the fray or to resist it. And I'm doing this in a practical application, merely in a practical application, not doctrinal. In that practical sense, you got to realize this. The singing, oh man, how can you resist it? The preaching, how can you resist it? Man, a Bible-believing church, how can you resist it? Scion, you got to be crazy to resist that. But at the end, you can make that choice yourself. I want you to look at Acts 7, 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and years, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Why do you resist the Holy Ghost? It's pretty tough to do that. Why don't you just stop and give in, huh? Stop resisting. When that singing comes out, stop resisting, sing it. When the preaching comes out and, man, it hits you hard, stop resisting. When altar call happens and then the Holy Spirit drives you, man, isn't that great? Come along with them. Stop resisting it. And God tells you through a sinful life that you're struggling with, through a trial that you're trying to fight and overcome, And then when that defeatist attitude comes out, I just quit. Stop resisting that fire burning in your heart that says, whoa, man, that word has power. Oh, it comes with a price and heartaches and heavy aches in the church and in the Christian life. But you can't resist that doctrine. You can't resist the meat that you're eating. You can't resist the fellowship. And you can't resist the preaching. Stop resisting. Don't resist the singing. Sing it out. Don't resist the shouting. Shout it out. Don't resist the altar call. Come down. Don't resist the preaching. Get right with God. Don't resist the Holy Ghost. When you get that something inside you and that Holy Spirit wants to come out of you and it is so irresistible, give in. Don't resist. Don't resist. Give in to the Holy Ghost. Get right with God. Every head bowed, every eye shut.